Hello, everyone. It is wonderful to be here with you all. I'm Rabbi Nicole Auerbach, and I am joined today uh, by our illustrious past president, uh, Howard Sharfstein. Uh, Howard, it's great to be here with you. Well, thank you, Nicole. I love being with you, even in this moment. <laughs> and, and I love the topic of today's conversation. I'm really, really um, thrilled uh, that we could continue our conversation about advanced care planning. Um, so our inspiration for today's topic was, um, Howard is um, really the, the champion of um, advanced care planning and helping our members ask the questions they need to ask as they think about what they want, um, as they think about the end of their lives, um, encouraging us to not shy away from having the important conversations that we need to have in order um, to have the lives that we want and to prepare for the end of our life in the way that we want. Um, so uh, that's the bigger context. And the smaller context is um, I really wanted um, to ask Howard, um, what I was missing in my hit by a bus folder. So this is my actual, uh, a folder that lives in my house. It is called hit by a bus in a sort of dark humor kind of way. Um, and what it contains is all of the um, items that we think someone might need if, um, God forbid, something were to happen to us and they needed to access information um, because we weren't here or couldn't speak for ourselves. So um, I wanted to, we're gonna talk a little bit about the why of advanced care planning. And then we're gonna dig into a little bit of the nitty gritty about what belongs in that folder and why perhaps a folder that sits in my bedroom is not the best place uh, to be collecting all of these materials, um, which should be somewhere else. So um, to start off with Howard, I really wanted to just ask you, you know, where does your passion for this topic come from? You've really been, as I said, a champion in our congregation on this topic. Well, well so much of what we do in life is um, um, guided by um, what's happened in our lives. Um, if we are ever dealing with the death of a loved one and we see what the process is, we say to ourselves, how can we honor that person and how can we make the process more respectful? Um, I was brought to this uh, topic when my father suffered a, a, a debilitating stroke. And um, the doctors said that it was bad and there was a little hope of recovery to any meaningful quality of life, but that we could keep him alive, in quotes, by uh, putting in um, artificial nutrition. And um, my father had spoken often about his uh, wish not to live a compromised life, not to be dependent on others, not to be deprived of the things that made life meaningful, such as family, golf, a couple of vodkas at the end of the day, um, it sounds superficial, but it's not. What he was really telling us was, if my life becomes so compromised that I am um, so distant from what I cherish, um, then I don't want to continue living. So we made a decision not to put in the, the feeding tube. He died a couple of days later, um, apparently very peacefully. And I, I saw the power of the fact that he had told us what he wanted and that we were able to follow through on his wishes. Mm. And what strikes me in your telling of that story is how connected these end of life decisions are to our own understanding of what makes life meaningful while we're living it, right? What are the values that we hold dear? What, what are the things that, um, that we most value in our lives, uh, which, you know, even aside from end of life planning, it's a good thing for us to, 
to figure out what those things are with because we have a limited time on this earth and if and we should spend more of our time doing those things probably yeah i mean you know the question this whole process of what matters and and thinking about these issues are a number of questions what makes life meaningful how would i view a life in which i am not able to experience participate um, if you define life as simply being, that's one thing. But if you define life as having a content, having a, a, a meaning beyond a being, then these are important issues that you need to think about for yourself and, and not only come to conclusions, but to share those um, wishes with those who should know. I believe that memories are strongest at the end. And by that, I mean, we will always remember how our loved ones died. I remember with great clarity how my father died, as I just told you, how my mother died. And I don't want those memories to be dark. I don't want those memories to be um, uh, disagreements among the families. I want those memories to be um, full and supportive. Mm -hmm. And the memories of what we did for my father just it puts a smile on my face. Yeah, it can. Um, I think for those of us who have witnessed what we call a good death, um, it really um, it can be a beautiful and meaningful part of someone's life. Um, and for those of us who have experienced, you know, the other side, we can see how painful, um, how painful it can be. And I think, you know, from the perspective of clergy, we talk to families, um, oftentimes who are struggling with what their loved one would have wanted, um, when it comes to these decisions and, um, you know, sometimes there is agreement and sometimes there's disagreement. And I can say that, you know, one of the greatest gifts that you can give your loved ones is to let them know exactly what you wanted so that they don't have to spend time second guessing, right? They can focus on um, being with you, being with each other, um, and not on uh, guilt or shame or any of those things that can come with making a decision for someone when you're not sure what they would have wanted. Um, and I'll just put in, you know, interject here that um, the kinds of questions we're asking are kosher questions. They're uh, Jewish questions. Um, Jewish tradition obviously puts, uh, you know, an incredible value on human life. Um, we are made in the image of God, and part of the way we honor that is to preserve life wherever we can. Um, and at the same time, we our tradition teaches us that when you know death is inevitable, and uh, and someone is suffering, it is okay. Um, and in fact, the loving and kind can be the loving and kind thing to do to take away impediments to their passing peacefully rather than, you know, having them continue on um, in a state where, uh, where they are not having a life that is meaningful or where they're suffering. Um, and, you know, we don't have uh, time in our conversation to sort of go into all of the Jewish texts on this subject, but I would say that for anyone who is struggling with the question of, you know, what does Judaism have to say about this decision versus that decision, uh, your clergy are always here uh, for you and are happy to make time to, um, to delve into that and connect you with resources uh, that can help, um, you know, assuage any, any feelings uh, that you might have on, on that front. Um, Nicole used the critical word. It's a gift. It truly is a gift to your family. In my 50 plus years of um, being a lawyer, I have seen families that are uh, pulled apart irrevocably because of disagreements over end of life decisions. That shouldn't happen. And you could prevent that from happening by having these 
thoughts in your mind, coming to conclusions and sharing them. Please understand that while you're alive and well and able to communicate, you make your own healthcare decisions. No one is gonna contradict your decisions. You have control over that. We're talking about when you're no longer able to communicate. And that's when these issues become important. Um, mm. It is, um, I cannot think of someone who, who leaves these issues um, unattended to. It, it is, um, I, I can't come up with the right words. It's just not good. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it really isn't. And the What Matters program at Central, we are there for you. We, can, we have trained facilitators, um, Nicole and myself and others who can have as a conversation for as long as you wish on these matters of what makes life meaningful. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit, um, so What Matters is an initiative um, that takes, a, takes place in institutions across the city, uh, JCC in Manhattan. We met with our friends at Road of Sholem for uh, a movie screening over the weekend. They have a program there. Can you, and we have these amazing facilitators. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happens in a What Matters conversation? So if I called you up and said, I want to, help you, you know, will you help me with a what matters conversation? What would we do? It's a, it's a confidential one-on-one -on -one or one with a couple conversation, um, speaking about their life experiences. And most people who wanna have the conversation say, I remember when so-and-so, and it, it, was not, it was not a good um, time in my life. Um, we talk about, again, what makes life meaningful we talk about what you um, are losing when you are no longer able to communicate. And um, then we talk about who should make the decisions for you in that circumstance, and that's your healthcare proxy. And we spend a good amount of time talking about the right person to, do, to be your proxy. Most married couples say, well, it's each other, of course, that makes sense. But then if the other is not around, who is the successor? If there are a number of children, we discuss how do you pick among the children? If there are no children, who would be the right proxy? We talk about the need to speak with the proxy and get their assent, consent before you name them. We talk about how to execute a proxy. We talk about having a card in your wallet that shows you've named a proxy and that's the person who should be contacted. We talk about updating the forms. As I mentioned to Nicole earlier today, our views on the end of life when we're 55 are different than our views on end of life when we're 75. So right. we keep thinking about it. It's a very warm, welcoming conversation. And it's really, in, 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 it's aimed at eliciting from you your thoughts and what's important and how can those thoughts be uh, carried through? Mm -hmm. So I wanna um, look at my folder for a minute. So um, I dug this out last night in preparation for our call. Um, it lives in a, you know, in a file uh, folder with all of our passports and birth certificates and things. Um, so in it, the good news is I do have a will uh, in here. Um, but what I was surprised to find, so I have healthcare proxies and power of attorney here. Um, I was surprised to find that I actually have two different healthcare proxy forms in here. Um, one is from 2005 and one is from 2007. So it's obviously been a very long time since I've taken a look at them. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so I'm, I'm overdue, um, but I'm, so I'm wondering sort of what is the right time to start thinking about these things? Uh, for me, I know it was around when I had kids, you know, when I was doing my will, we sort of did it at the same time, but what are the, what are the things that should trigger us going back uh, and making sure that, you know, it's, the answers are still the answers that we have, as you said, our, our lives change and, and we might imagine in one part of our life, I would never want to live with, you know, 
X, Y, Z. And by the time you get to that part of your life, you're like, actually, I live a perfectly meaningful life and, you know, my choices might be different. Yeah, well, I say to clients um, on New Year's Day, you should look at it. And Nicole said, well, that's Yom Kippur. <laughs> we, should, we should look at it at Yom Kippur. We should, you know, see that the documents are right and that our thoughts are, are correct um, or reflect what we want. It does need to be looked at. That hit by the bus folder is very important. You really need to leave, I call it a roadmap of your life um, for others to find. Um, what I've done is I've done a couple of sheets of paper that lists what I consider to be the pertinent information. Where's my will? Who's my accountant? Um, who's my doctor? Um, where's my life insurance? Et cetera, et cetera. Everything is there. And I have dealt with families where someone dies, they have not left that kind of inst instructions. And the family is not only dealing with the tragedy of death, but they're dealing with not knowing, not knowing where are things. You know, I, I always tell the story of the client who wanted to have the original copy of her will. Usually my law firm keeps it so everyone knows where it is. She wanted hers. She died. We couldn't find it. <laughs> And if you can't find an original will, it's a problem. It's a legal problem. Mm -hmm. So search the whole apartment, couldn't find it. And then her daughter said, you know, my mother loved her cashmere sweaters. So we went into the, the woman's closet, pile of cashmere sweaters, buried in there was her will. Mm -hmm. um, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> Clearly that shouldn't happen. <laughs> um, so leave a roadmap. And mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether it's hit by a bus, or it's called the roadmap, and then you share it with those who should know, and um, they're very grateful. Uh -huh. They're very grateful with the knowledge. So that's what you, you definitely need to do. This is all about personal reflection and doing the right thing. Uh -huh. Right, so I mean, it occurs to me that, I love it that, that the answer was the cashmere sweaters because this folder, I think, at times has lived in my husband's sweater chest. Um, but obviously, that's not the most useful place for this information to be living. Because if something happened, we would want, you know, healthcare teams or um, other folks to have easy access to the information. So, where should we, for example, if we want to have, you know, advanced care directives that say, um, you know, I don't want to be resuscitated or I don't want to be intubated or I don't want artificial nutrition. Where should we be keeping those things so that the right people have them? Well, obviously your proxy should have it, copies. There's successor proxy should have a copy. You should put a copy in the medical records with your primary care physician. Um, you should, some people put a copy on their refrigerator. Uh -huh. um, there is a form called a MOLST, M-O-L-S-T form, which is another form that people fill out, which is intended primarily for uh, physicians and um, emergency care um, uh, helpers to, to look at, let's say you're, you live alone, you suffer a heart attack, you're on the floor, it's on your refrigerator. It's all a matter of putting together your wishes and letting people know. Very important to put it in the file of your primary care physician and update it and make mm -hmm. sure that he or she, you know, acknowledges that it's there. And how, um, how bound by our wishes are healthcare providers? I know you shared with me recently an article about um, folks who, you know, medical care professionals had not followed their wishes to not receive um, sort of heroic measures. Um, and they were actually suing for, you know, wrongful life in effect, uh, saying I didn't want to be kept alive uh, in this way. So with the most form or other things, um, in your experience, how effective are they? I, I was surprised by the article. Um, because in my experience, if, if Dr. S, who's the proxy? and they wanna know what the proxy says, and that's it. Um, in New York, a proxy 
is legally entitled to make the healthcare decisions. And if the hospital, the doctor is reluctant, <clears throat> then you have to keep pressing the issue. You have to speak to the, the legal staff at the institution. You can't be passive. You have to keep pushing your rights, which are recognized in New York law. Mm -hmm. uh, in that article, the people who sued won. They collected money from the hospitals for failure to follow their wishes as a proxy. Mm -hmm. And I think that will put more institutions on on uh, alert that, that they need to follow the proxy's directions. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about hospitals not following proxy's directions. I'm worried about people who don't <clears throat> do a proxy and think about what they want. Right. So um, I'm going to put up uh, the proxy on the screen here for us, uh, just so that folks can get a sense of, um, you can find this, uh, the JCC has uh, a lot of resources on their website. Um, we can get you copies of a health pro for care proxy. If you look up New York Healthcare Proxy, uh, you'll find this form. Um, so let's just take a quick look at, um, you know, what's included in this proxy and what are the kind of uh, questions I'm just gonna do from current slide. Okay, so here's, oops. Here's our proxy. Um, so what are we doing here? We're appointing someone to make decisions for us if we're unable to make decisions. And we also have an alternate in case, you know, God forbid we're in a car accident with our spouse who we've named as our proxy and neither one of us is able to, uh, to respond. Um, Let me just point out for a second, Nicole. Let's say you have three children. Mm -hmm. in, in New York, you can only name one proxy at a time. <clears throat> you cannot name three at a time, because the law doesn't want disagreements among the three, mm -hmm. so one person. So I often hear, well, how can I pick among my children? Um, mm -hmm. Physical proximity to where you are, so that they can be there on site quicker. A child that reflects <clears throat> your values more than the others, perhaps. Um, and then when you make a decision, explain it while you're alive. Don't let your children, after you're lying there, wonder why did they pick my sister and not me? Right. Um, that can be divisive. So pick one and then tell them why they picked that one. Presumably you just pick your favorite, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> One, um, one who calls you regularly. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> um, no, but I think that there are also some people who um, more naturally um, carry out this kind of obligation without, you know, feelings of guilt or, um, you know, anxiety in ways that other people, you know, wouldn't want to be put in the position. And it's good to do, it's a good to know people, um, you know, who they are. I guess looking at this proxy, um, one thing, is there another document that would help us, you know, it allows someone to make decisions for me, but how do I get into the nitty gritty with my family about, um, you know, I do want hydration, but I don't want artificial nutrition or I, you know, because I know that doctors want us to be as specific as possible, you know, in terms of what kind of resuscitation or we're not supposed to just say no heroic measures because then the question is, well, what's a heroic measure? So how do we, how do we document that level of specificity? Well, you can, you can be specific in the form or in a, on a page attached to the form. Mm -hmm. um, the, the form of proxy that we use, first of all, condi conditions the decisions on your treating doctor certifying that there is no reasonable expectation of recovery to a meaningful quality of life. Mm -hmm. When that uh, pertains, then you, our form has specific things you can check or not check. Um, most people, <clears throat> when they made the decision that if, if their lives are so compromised that they're going to not be able to do what and see and be what's meaningful, then they say, don't do anything. Just give me palliative care, no pain, and let me go. Mm -hmm. The other thing that people need to consider is, and it's in 
I've seen a lot of people add this to their proxies. I want to die at home. I don't want to die in a hospital. So if it's physically possible for me to, to be home, mm-hmm. that's what I wish. Um, I, I, my suggestion is not to be too specific because if you're too specific, then if you leave something out, questions are raised. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the famous case in New York of a woman who was a, um, an oncology nurse and she told her daughters, I don't want to die like my patients. I don't want to die that way. Then she had a stroke. And this was before all this, what matters in proxies. And the doctors asked, well, what did your mother say if she had a stroke? And they said, well, she didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. So it became an issue. What you need to do, I think, is to be broad and don't be picky as to what you want or you don't want. Mm. Um, because that which you leave out raises an issue. Um, I'm remembering, was it in the book uh, When Breath Becomes Air or was it somewhere else that I read um, that someone's standard was, you know, could they enjoy a baseball game and chocolate ice cream? Yeah, that's, um, that's Atul Gawande's book, uh, Being Mortal. Being Mortal. Being Mortal, which I recommend to everybody. It's a nice little book. And what Dr. Gawande says, we doctors know how to keep you alive. We don't know how to help you die. Yeah. And we and don't, also- and we don't, we'll, we, left to our own devices, we'll do everything. We'll put you on every machine. We'll do whatever it takes. That's us. So we are doctors. What we don't know and we're trying to learn is how to be respectful of a person's wishes. And Gawande wrote the book some few years ago now, and it's changed the views of the medical profession. So I recommend everyone get it. I, I told Gawande, who writes often for the New Yorker. Yeah, it was, it was really a remarkable book. And I love the specificity of that because without saying, here are all of the measures, it gives your family you know, a benchmark of, you know, can he enjoy the baseball game and a chocolate ice cream? Um, well, then they can, they can make decisions. And I do, um, you know, I've, I've worked a little bit in hospice settings uh, during my rabbinic training and also just want to put a plug in here um, that, you know, people are eligible for hospice um, if they have an illness um, that they are not expected to recover from and their life expectancy is six months or under. Um, You can get a re-up though. If you unexpectedly live past six months, um, you get to stay in. You don't use up your hospice. Um, And unfortunately, what I saw when I was working in a hospice was that folks would only come in, you know, four or five days before they died. And so they would only get the benefit of the palliative care, the supportive care, the, um, uh, you know, the pastoral care um, and other support that is offered for the very last days when actually it's, it, it can be a huge benefit. So this is just my, my related plug for, um, you know, it doesn't mean you're giving up um, if you decide that hospice or supportive care is the, is the best way forward for you. Um, and it's really something, uh, again, to hopefully consider earlier on. Um, I'd like to state the obvious, which my wife reminds me I do too often, but um, dying is unpleasant. People don't want to talk about it. Um, I've dedicated a lot of time to this <clears throat> issue for many years. And when I sat down with my kids to talk about it, they said, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, it we'll, we'll do it some other time. No, nope, now's the time. And you, you really need it to do it. I, be, I, I have no means to convince you to have these conversations other than to tell you to do it. And if you don't, you're losing an opportunity to make a strong, powerful, caring gift to your loved ones. Mm. Thank you. Yes, in the in the movie, um, we had a movie discussion over the weekend about the remarkable film "Dying Doesn't Feel Like What I'm Doing," which is uh, really a portrait of the last year and a half of the life of Rabbi Rachel Cowan, um, who was a teacher to many of us and the head of um, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. And she says in that in that film, she said, "You know, 
there's a story we tell ourselves that we're never going to die um, and that we can control everything, right? And the fact is, again, coming back to, you know, Yom Kippur, where we land every year, what is Yom Kippur? When we say, you know, who by fire and who by water, it's a radical reckoning with the fact that we actually don't know whether we're written in the book of life for this coming year and we're not completely in control. Um, and no one wants to face that. And it is, um, death is a part of life and it is not, you know, it is deeply unpleasant <laughs> and no one wants to think about it, but that doesn't mean, um, that our lives can't be made fuller by our um, by our talking about it before we we think we have to. Um, and so, you know, I think another pitch that I have for folks is, don't wait to come in and make your what matters conversation until you're in your 70s or 80s. Right? These are the kinds of conversations that. Um, you know, folks in their 40s and 50s can start having with their uh, with their families. And uh, just, I think it also gives you a perspective on your life uh, and on how you want to live your life uh, before you need to think about these things. Um, because uh, it really, it really raises this question of, you know, what do you value? What is what matters to you? Um, and what's important? And uh, I can't think of a more important Jewish question uh, for us to answer than that. Um, Beautifully said, Nicole. Thank you. Beautifully said. So after this, um, so I'm going to update my healthcare proxy um, uh, so that um, at least, I mean, the address I have down for my sister, let's just say in the healthcare proxy was like four addresses ago. So that is not good. Um, uh, I'm going to get a card to put in my wallet. Are there any other last uh, bits of um, advice you have for me as I uh, try to get things in order for myself here? Have you talked to your sister? I have. Okay. Yes. And, and um, if your thoughts changed, you're ready to talk to your sister again. And she's, she's, it's also very important that she acknowledges, okay, Nicole, if those horrible circumstances pertain, I will make those decisions to withdraw care and let you die peacefully. Is she mm -hmm. okay with that? I think we need to have that conversation again. You know, yeah. it was a long time ago that we had the conversation and, and in a way, right, we were both in different parts of our lives. And, um, and so, yeah, it's really important. I mean, I, I am the proxy for a couple of people and I know that, um, for me, as the one taking on responsibility, it was so important for me to sit down across that table and have them really be clear with me on what they wanted and for me to be able to say, yes, that is something I will do for you. Um, so I, I agree, it's time to sit down with my sister again, I think. So. Um, have lunch, it'll be good. <laughs> Yeah, always lunch, you know, somewhere nice. Um, but um, so if folks uh, who are members of Central Synagogue want to help start this conversation, and if, if people need help having the conversation with their loved ones, um, will What Matters facilitators sit down with them and their loved ones also? Absolutely, and I've done Great. that. Absolutely. So if I, if I say I'm actually too anxious, I don't think I can have this conversation, you know, without some help, we can, we can help do that. Um, Absolutely. So if you're a member of Central and you want to do this, uh, please um, get in touch. You can get in touch with me. You can get in touch with Carolyn Ressler, who is in our adult engagement um, group. You can get in touch with Howard. Um, you, if you are not a member of Central Synagogue, um, there are What Matters sites um, all, all over the place. JCC has a wonderful What Matters um, program, um, as do several other um, sites and we're happy to connect you because this is this is important for everyone. So, um, all right. Any any final words, Howard? No, I'm just grateful for the time, and I'm I'm, I'm grateful for um, Nicole's uh, wisdom and support. Oh, thank you. I'm grateful for you. Um, so, to all of you, um, our our blessing for you is may you have uh, many long years of joy and health and happiness ahead of you. 
And may you use at least a little tiny bit of that time that you have to have these very important conversations. And uh, may it lead you to understand what is really important in your life um, and how you want to live the moments you have. Uh, so lots of love to all of you. And we will, uh, we will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.